If you were a kid who watched Nickelodeon in the mid-2000s, chances are you heard about a very certain game. You may not have played it for yourself, but you likely saw it at least a few times through one of Nickelodeon's several advertisements for it. The channel often aired commercials for its website, Nick.com, and many of them featured games you could play either on the website or by downloading them. Free trials were offered, but most of the time, the full versions had to be bought. Many games came and went, receiving various degrees of success, but one particular game garnered an awful lot of attention following its release. This is the story of Spongebob Diner Dash. Let's start with a little history. Diner Dash is a popular game series originally developed by Game Lab and published by Play First. It would go on to be one of the most downloaded games in the world at the time of its release. The story concerns a girl named Flo who works in the appropriately named Diner Town. In the game, you manage a series of restaurants and try to gain approval from the many customers that frequent them. It made for a nice little restaurant simulation game. In 2006, the Friars would heat up once more when Nickelodeon collabed with Play First to create a SpongeBob SquarePants version of the game. It received a ton of marketing and seemed like a really big deal at the time. This was one of the biggest things to come out of the Nick Arcade. In addition to Play First, this game was also developed by snap to play who had previously worked on Obstacle Odyssey with another company called Retro64. Cute as it was, Obstacle Odyssey was actually a complete reskin of another Retro 64 game called Best Friends Forever. This was a common practice for Nick Arcade games. Another big game of theirs, Krabby Quest, was also a reskin of a game called Wonderland. It's no question that SpongeBob Diner Dash was just a SpongeBob version of the regular Diner Dash, so at least the folks at Nickelodeon weren't even trying to hide their reskinning tendencies anymore. Two versions of this game were released. The original 2006 version came out on the PC, but an app version came out in 2009. The story revolved around Mr. Krabs' decision to expand the Krusty Krab for the sake of building his empire. That's one way of putting it, I guess. The game would then play out the same way Diner Dash did. You drag customers to a table, wait for them to look at the menu, then take their order. Wait, Squidward makes the food in this? If the show is anything to go by, Mr. Krabs better bury those dreams of fame and fortune. You serve the customers, collect their checks, throw the dishes away, then repeat the process. It was straightforward, but the game got notoriously difficult when more customers would start to come in at the same time. Some of the customers you serve include the average minnow, the cod, who don't mind waiting for their food but they suck at tipping, anchovies, who are impatient but good tippers, groupers, who just outright suck, Sturgeons, who will perform surgery for you, and Bubble Bass, aka the VIP customer. You can become Employee of the Month, love that game, if you impress him, but if you get on his nerves, it costs you a lot of points. He probably gives you a bad review on the web series that he apparently hosts. This game is not for people who are easily overwhelmed. It's so stressful having to work so quickly and serve so many impatient fish. This is basically a stress simulator. It really goes to show how hard it is to work retail on a busy day. If you could handle the onslaught of starving fish, you would work your way up to locations such as Bikini Palace and the Flying Dutchman ship, just as long as we don't have to play pinball on it this time. Another stage was a really cool restaurant on a dock called Anchors Away. After you beat Anchors Away, you unlock this new restaurant called Le Crab. The great King Neptune himself shows up and offers to partner with Mr. Krabs in his newest establishment. This was a nice tie-in to King Neptune's first appearance in the show, where he seemed a little more obsessed with fry cooking, though it does use his design from the movie. He then gives Spongebob two new hands to make the food serving process much easier. I mean, I guess that helps. But are you ready for a big helping of disappointment? I know I am. At the end of the game, it turns out that everything was just a dream. How's that for making your effort meaningless? They might as well have had King Neptune reverse time so none of this ever happened. But they do have a line hinting at a potential sequel, and would you believe it? There actually is one. It didn't actually continue the story, though. The sequel, Two Times the Trouble, had a more serious plot and a lot more detail than the first one. Wait, Two Times the Trouble? Obstacle Odyssey 2 was called Time Trouble. At this point, they're even reskinning the titles. Like in Obstacle Odyssey 2, the story is told through comic panels like the ones from the Nickelodeon magazines. 
Snap to Play worked on both games, so it's understandable that they'd be similar. Essentially, a shark businessman named Sharky Two Times shows up and offers to buy the Krusty Krab to make it into a casino. He should follow in his brother's footsteps and make a movie instead. SpongeBob is against the idea, so he sets out to prove he can sell enough Krabby Patties to make so much money that selling the Krusty Krab would be meaningless. Then the game plays out in the same way the first one did, but with a few more features. This is actually a reskin of the second Diner Dash game, but by now, did you honestly expect anything else? This time, you can actually play as different characters throughout the stages. Giving up on the Krusty Krab, Sharky goes to buy Goo Lagoon instead, but Patrick comes along to stop him. When that fails for him, Sharky goes to the Chum Bucket, but Plankton magically turns into an expert salesman and sends him away. Seriously, what does Sharky two times think this is? Monopoly? Now the next stage has a bit of a twist. Sharky goes to buy the Medieval Moments building from the Spongebob episode Dunces and Dragons. It makes for an interesting tie-in using a location from the show that we don't see very often. Squidward loves this place because it simply oozes culture, so he puts on his clown suit and serves a bunch of customers to scare Sharky away. At the very end, Gary comes back from playing in the dump and convinces Spongebob and Sharky to start the new business there instead. I gotta admit, that's really clever. I appreciate little twists like that. Mostly, these games were what you could expect them to be. If you were looking for Diner Dash with Spongebob characters pasted all over it, what you see is what you get. Many people found these games to be notoriously difficult, and they're really long, too. It can take several days to complete a full playthrough if you aren't an expert at diner dashing. But more than anything, this was just a cute couple of inoffensive little kitchen simulator games. Or was it? This may come as shocking to some, but would you have ever guessed that this silly Spongebob collaboration was actually a little controversial? In December of 2012, Spongebob Diner Dash was pulled from the iTunes App Store after a serious privacy complaint. This game faced a rather gruesome battle with the App Store, trying its best to stay accessible against all odds. So what went wrong exactly? A group based in Washington, D.C. called the Center for Digital Democracy, or the CDD, stated that the game collected information such as full names and email addresses from children without parental consent, which violated a policy known as COPA, or the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. The Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, was encouraged to investigate both Nickelodeon and Play First. SpongeBob Diner Dash required in-game purchases, which used virtual coins to buy both later stages and upgrades to enhance gameplay. It also gave the option for the player to send in their name and email address to join a newsletter. In addition, it also sent push notifications to a player's device. This required the app to collect a string of numbers so it could uniquely identify the individual device. The concerns regarded how the information provided to make these purchases was being used by Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon denied that they were collecting the information, but they willingly removed the game from the App Store so they could investigate the issue for themselves. The Center for Digital Democracy noted that this was not the first instance of something like this occurring. Many other mobile games were being criticized for similar practices. During their investigation, Nickelodeon argued that the prompt requesting personal information was part of the template they used to make the game and the information entered was not collected, even mentioning that the push notifications were in line with the law. They denied the COPA violation, but the CDD didn't accept it. According to them, the purchase tokens were still used for identification and were therefore still in violation of COPA. Within days of the accusation, the FTC amended the policy by updating a rule to require parental consent when companies request sensitive information. This update placed stricter enforcement on the already existing rule and fixed a loophole that allowed third-party companies to collect information. So was this the end of SpongeBob Diner Dash? Not entirely, but I can't imagine it helped the game very much. It remained playable through other sources until its hardware stopped being supported. Nickelodeon moved on from it and pursued other projects. Their much later game, Krusty Cook-Off, could be seen as a successor or a replacement to the Diner Dash games. It contained a similar premise, but with a newer format, though it did bear a striking resemblance to another app called Cooking Fever. So basically, SpongeBob Diner Dash faded with time, but with how much emphasis Nickelodeon used to put on it, it's a hard game to forget. It marks a period in Nickelodeon history and is undoubtedly one of the more notable highlights of the Nick Arcade. 
The Diner Dash series itself would continue on, even having its share of spin-offs like Cooking Dash and Wedding Dash. It isn't as big as it used to be, but it still maintains a dedicated following. The days of SpongeBob Diner Dash may be long behind us now, but it will certainly remain a noteworthy collab in Nickelodeon's gaming history. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.